effective. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mike. We're ready now for questions. Please be sure to give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. And we'll start here in the front with Jay. Jay Barbary with NBC. Uh, I'm noticing that your uh, launch inclination here is 34.5, I believe, instead of uh, 51.6, which is the inclination to the space station. And I believe uh, that that takes you over into northern Europe. I know you have FAA approval to launch. Does that include approval to launch over uh, Europe? Because uh, at nine minutes, I believe, at traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, you could, under the worst set of circumstances, uh, drop Dragon on Europe or close by or somewhere there. I don't have a line to go out here, but would you address that, please? Sure. The uh, license that we have with the FAA is comprehensive, and it covers all phases of flight. Um, so uh, we – absolutely. That's correct. Now, uh, well, if I can follow up, then while we have the microphone here. You were talking about 12 missions that you have under contract with NASA already. Are these 12 cargo delivery missions not including any of the um, – the flights that you're doing here on test demonstration, is it three test demonstration flights plus 12 go going with cargo, and when do you expect under the best circumstances, assuming that everything goes pretty well with your test, to be able to, deli to deliver your first cargo to the ISS? Okay, there was a lot of questions there, but hopefully I'll get them all. Uh, the 12 flights under CRS are separate and distinct for the COTS flights. Uh, the original program plan had three demonstration flights. Uh, if we see success, we're going to look to try to attempt to get to the station on the second flight. Uh, um, but uh, that's, uh, that's obviously f decisions for a later day. Uh, I think there was another question in there. Be carrying oh. cargo on that second flight. Uh, possibly. possibly. Possibly we'll be carrying cargo. So we anticipate uh, completing the ISS uh, COTS missions next year. Uh, and executing a cargo mission under the CRS contract as well. So with uh, Atlantis flying this summer with enough to take supplies, enough supplies to the space station for a year, then uh, you're talking about summer 2012 that you might be able to start delivering? No, next year, 2011. 2011, 2011 you, is you correct. You could start delivering. That's correct, yeah. Right. It's up to NASA to plan the manifest, but that's our plan. Okay, thank you, sir. Marsha? Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Quick uh, question for Ms. Shotwell, then an NASA question. Um, is there a cost of, uh, attached to the upcoming flight? A cost? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, you're asking, am I going to share that? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, we don't really talk about costs at SpaceX. Um, I can say that our pricing is on the web, uh, and it does cover – uh, uh, the cost of the, uh, the goods sold, the cost of the operations with some margin as well. And um, for Mr. McAllister, do you, um, do you believe that whether the flight goes good or bad can be a contributor to the anti-commercial forces out there? I mean, how important is it for this flight to succeed so you don't get all that uh, questioning and debating and all that that's been going on so far for so many months? Right. That's a, that's a great point, and that's why I wanted to emphasize that this is a test flight. It is not, uh, it is not a, in any way an indictment for or against the overall program if you have anomalies. We expect anomalies, and again, the purpose of the test flight is to learn. So as long as we're learning and we have um, a clear path for dem demonstration flight two, we would consider that success successful. Um, we're not going to know until the end of the program if, if, uh, if we've been ultimately successful in achieving the capability of delivering these services to ISS. But what we can say is, to date, this has been a remarkably successful program. Um, and again, just to, again, to reemphasize my earlier comments, even if there is a, 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 even if we have a bad day, for example, for this first demonstration flight, we expect to move forward. Uh, we do not expect that to be a, it's not a condition that all the test flights be successful for us to move forward. Uh, we would never make that because we plan to learn from these, move forward. We're committed to these, both NASA and SpaceX. We would certainly like to achieve launch into orbit, 
um, have the dragon separate and have a successful or a safe reentry. Those three things we would think are key um, for this demonstration flight. It's definitely a big step above the maiden flight objectives that happened uh, earlier this year. Um, but there's other things that we would like to test out, and we'd like to get data on those things. Um, so I definitely want to de-emphasize the um, sort of precursor nature of this or in, uh, in terms of the overall program. So far we're on very good track and uh, we hope to learn a lot from this program again or this test flight and mo continue to move forward regardless of the outcome. Bobby? Bobby Block with the Orlando Sentinel. I, I, you've been issue and the reason for the delay and what you might need to do and then I've got a follow up in a half. I'll tell you what I can. Keep in mind, um, I'm, I'm sharing pretty preliminary information with you. Um, they did, uh, in, the in the inspection of the final closeout photos this morning, sometime after 6 when I landed and before 10 uh, when I woke up. <laughs> so somewhere in that four-hour period, uh, uh, they determined that uh, their indications, in, in a, I believe it was in a weld joint, were such that we wanted to take some additional steps, certainly to uh, go ahead and actually look at it. We brought the vehicle down f to the horizontal this morning. Uh, they did some visual inspection. Uh, I believe it's back up vertical now, and they're doing some thrust vector control system wiggles. What did you see? I believe it's porosity and potentially cracking. I, I've not seen the, uh, anything other than uh, kind of top-level emails in a, in a well joint. Make sure I understand. The earliest is on. The earliest is Thursday. And if you have to replace the nozzle, Friday or Saturday. Friday or Saturday, yeah. Uh, the follow-up for Alan or um, or Phil. Um, given how much of a political hot potato commercial space flight has become, and given the success of COTS, I mean, what is your thinking about adapting the model? of, you know, not doing the requirements but doing capability for, for adapting that over for commercial crew, or do you have to go more to a traditional model of requirements, uh, or do you see some kind of, of, of in-between? And then also, because it's an issue here, um, you know, there's concern, is the future of the commercial spaceflight program going to be managed out of KSC? Okay. Um, in terms of the first part of the question, um, <laughs> I've already forgotten the first part of the question. I was starting to answer the second part. I was, what, Whatever you feel. Uh, oh, as, as a precursor. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, again, as I said in my intro, interim, or intro remarks, the COTS uh, cargo program is one of the programs that we are using um, as input into the commercial crew program. It has a lot of the features that we want for commercial crew. It allows flexibility. Uh, it allows the commercial pr partners to design the systems with a lot of freedom, and we think those are good things. The cost effectiveness of the program has, key, has been a key aspect. Uh, f I just, uh, it's, it's almost uh, unbelievable that we would get this far for less than a $300 million development effort um, in four years. Both of those things are remarkable and an anomaly in terms of any historical development that I'm aware of uh, in terms of a traditional NASA development. So there's clear things that we would like to incorporate into the commercial crew program. Uh, that being said, commercial crew is different than cargo. We're carrying people. Uh, there's human spaceflight certification requirements and standards that have to apply. So NASA is still in the process of developing the optimal acquisition strategy for commercial crew. And we're working on that right now, and we hope to be able to uh, um, get a consensus on that and release that information um, soon, uh, probably within the next six months. We should have a defined acquisition strategy on commercial crew. So, uh, but there's other features. We were also looking at the launch services program. There's some things that they do very, very well um, that we could leverage for commercial crew, as well as the Constellation program. Uh, that was the most recent one that we've done for human spaceflight. We learned a lot of things in Constellation program that we'd like to leverage, and even going back to shuttle. So uh, we're hopefully going to get the best and the best features of all those and design the optimal commercial crew program for what we're trying to do. Um, so right now, the cargo program is being managed by Allen, and we don't anticipate changing that model. Uh, Alan and his team are at JSC, but they use people from across the agency. Uh, for commercial crew, 
The lead center has been assigned for to KSC for commercial crew going forward. And if you've been following the commercial crew program, we currently have a uh, agreement out on the streets, the commercial crew development round two set of agreements. Uh, the announcement for proposals were released and proposals are due in later this month. And when we sign those agreements, they will be managed out of the KSC office. Irene. Um, Irene Klotz with uh, Reuters and Aviation Week. Um, Gwen, I had a couple questions for you. Um, the first is, what is the targeted altitude for Dragon? And could you please take us through the, um, uh, the on-orbit uh, mission objectives? Are you going to be changing orbit, firing thrusters, like how many times? Just kind of a little, um, maybe a little play-by-play -play of what you hope to accomplish in space. And then uh, related to that is uh, I understand your plan was to cut off um, your web stream after the rocket goes out of view, which is uh, good for camera people, but for text people, we kind of like incite the whole, through the whole process. And um, are you going to be able to give us any kind of real-time information of how the mission's going? Thanks. Okay, Irene. Uh, your first question was the altitude, uh, 300 kilometers for this particular mission. Uh, your your second question was oh kind of a play by play on what we're what we're trying to do with uh, with Dragon on orbit. Um, clearly, we want to separate it uh, from the second stage, uh, have it operate under its own power, do some maneuvering, uh, do telemetry, um, operate the guidance navigation and con exercise the guidance navigation and control system. This is also in your press packet, by the way. Um, conduct a deorbit burn, uh, re-enter safely. Um, and then, uh, obviously, we'd like to pick it up out of uh, the Pacific Ocean as well. And you had a third question on the webcast? Uh, yes, just as far as if you're going to, if this is going to be uh, transparent to anybody that's following the mission as far as what you're doing between uh, after a couple of minutes, I guess, after launch until splashdown. Uh, well, I know, well, I, I should defer this question to Kirsten Brost, our uh, communications manager. Um, our, our webcasts in the past have, uh, have shown the, uh, the orbit insertion. Uh, certainly we did that for the first Falcon 9 flight. Um, I, I don't know what the plan is for post-Dragon uh, insertion uh, and then uh, splashdown. Our, our typical is to be pretty open, so let me just follow up with Kirsten and, and we'll get back with you before I leave here today, okay? Okay. I think we're pretty public about these things, so we'll, we'll see. Bill? 